Talk Nerdy is brought to you by its sponsor, AT&T, which provides IU students, faculty, and staff with personal cellular services at discounted rates. Talk Nerdy to Me, a conversation about technology's hottest topics at Indiana University and beyond. Just one, two. Whatever, Joe. Okay, <laughs> off we go. Welcome to episode 17 of Talk Nerdy to Me, a conversation about technology at IU and beyond. I'm your host, Janae Cummings, and with me as always is the wash to my Mal Reynolds, Brendan Howell, and our sound man, Joe Stone. How goes it, gentlemen? Pretty good. Life is all back to normal for me, so. Because your job isn't giving you a hard time anymore? It wasn't giving me a hard time. It's just a really busy season for us. I consider so. that a hard time. Mm, what I about know. you, I liked Joe? it, like when it's all done. Oh, I cut you off yeah, to you ask did. about Joe. I'm sorry. That was rude. And I still care about you. Go on. Like I said, when it was all done, I feel like I had graduated from like college or high school again. Like when we were all done, we're like, we made it. It was a busy season. So. Should we, have a, we, should, we should have like a celebration for you. Oh, Cakes and beverages. That. Yeah. So what's up, Joe? Now that I'm not cutting Brendan off anymore. <laughs> Absolutely everything. Nothing. Everything. I can't even tell you. I've got so much school. I'm doing like 20 hours of homework probably a week. And I should probably be doing more because I'm not. What are you studying again? Analog electronics and just and finite math. I'm doing great in finite because that's mm-hmm. it's a little bit easier. Ooh. Yeah, you probably do tons of like finite type of math. No, maps. finite is not my favorite. Yeah, but do you still have to do it as a financial professional? No, I do accounting, so there's not really anything finite that I need to do for that. Okay, it's all yeah. the accounting principles. Analog electronics is like doing mazes where there are multiple paths, but depending on which way you travel down that path like whether or not a gate is open or closed. That probably isn't a very good metaphor. (laughs) I'm a writer, though, and I bet I could find one for you. I will bring you a schematic sometime, and you can look at it, and we'll (laughs) pretend it was my genius metaphor. Sweet, sweet. let's do it. So we got a packed lineup today. We're going to kick things off by talking to informatics student and startup founder Liam Bowling. Hi, Liam. Hi. From there, we'll check in with Ross on the latest tip from the UITS Support Center, and then we'll hit a couple items from the news, such as the explosion of Meerkat and Periscope and the latest goings-on with Facebook. We might even hit on a couple other items where we have time, but no promises. Sound good? Sounds good. Awesome. All right, perfect. As all of you out there know, it's been a few episodes since we had a guest on to talk nerdy with us. We're joined today by Liam Bowling, a sophomore at IU Bloomington School of Informatics and Computing and the co-founder of Greek Ride, a service that gives rides to guests to and from events. Welcome, Liam. Hi. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got the idea for Greek Ride. Yeah, sure. So um, it was back uh, freshman year, actually. I was driving, uh, voluntarily driving for my fraternity. And uh, at the end of the night, I had around like 50 calls or so, and uh, it was a lot of, you know, texting and driving, a lot of illegal things. So um, I decided to get back to my dorm and kind of find a solution for that. So I just started whipping together an app, and it just started then, and yeah. So So one just whips together an app. Um, yeah, that's, that's what happens. That's how yeah. it works. <laughs> Very late at night, it, it just turns into that. <laughs> I think when you're in informatics, that's That's true. That's possible. true. That's yeah. true. Let me just go home and get an app together. <laughs> so you have this idea, and having an idea, I think, for anything is one thing. We all have ideas. But how mm-hmm. do you turn that into a reality? How did you make that happen? Yeah, Particularly so, when you're a student. Yeah, that, good point. Um, so back, uh, I think I started like web development, I was like 13 years old. So I've been really into it for a while um, and then kind of transitioned to making apps when I was, uh, when I came to college. And I've always been, you know, wanted to do one really cool thing and I found this opportunity and went for it. So can you tell us how Greek ride works? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple app. I'll quickly like run through it, I guess, but you, you just like press a button and it says, send me a ride. You say where you want the ride from, what organization you want it from. And the ride comes to you. It sends you like a text when it gets close to you. Um, you can like track your driver on the map. It's it's very very similar to like Uber in that sense. Right. But um, you don't have to like pay for the driver. You don't pay for the ride. It's all volunteering. Um, so there's some aspects that are a little different. Uh, you, you know, another another aspect would be like Uber. You know exactly what car you're is picking you up yeah. and everything. But in this service, you know, it, it could be a different car, a different person, another day. So little different things. But so when we say Greek ride, are these rides for Greek students or are Greeks providing the rides? It's uh, <laughs> it's a it's a little tricky. Um, so it's it's Greek ride, but it could be any organization that has uh, volunteer drivers for a night. So 
we targeted it more towards like the Greek system because that's kind of how I you know, came up with the idea in a way. But it could be anyone, you know, one example would be, say, I don't, I don't know, you're having a party at your house and there's two people who are volunteering for the night, you give them 20 bucks to drive people around and, you know, they could all sign up with Greek Ride and be drivers of Greek Ride. So, yeah. That's kind of cool. It's more like an enclosed Uber, a smaller Uber, I guess. That's, that's actually really great. Um, is this something you're thinking about expanding beyond IU? Um, or beyond Bloomington, rather? Yeah, different different college campuses, definitely. We're, we're actually, like, talking to um, a couple on the East Coast, so UConn, um, uh, Northeastern, and then a little bit north towards uh, FSU, some down in Florida, as well as a little uh, Arizona and some California schools. So we're in talks with all of them, starting to expand pretty pretty soon once some final testing is done of Greek right here. But, yeah. So how are you paying for all this? Um, what's nice is, you know, normally like a startup has to go find a developer right. and make the app and you know, drop like $100,000 right. or something like that. But, you know, I'm kind of like a, a nerd, so I just like did it myself. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's no expenses, actually, which is kind of nice. So, so the first investors day, or anything like that? Yeah, we have a couple investors. Um, they took like a very low amount of equity for some money. We didn't really need that much. So, you know, we didn't need a developer. We didn't need like a ton of marketing. Um, so yeah, we have some investors. We actually have Facebook as one of the the people like help funding us, funding us. That's uh, really awesome. Yeah, it's kind of neat. So you're doing anything with the Hoosier Hatchery? Are you involved uh, there? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, so the Hoosier Hatchery was kind of uh, they were going to some like transitional periods. I think like last year or so, and we just um, my co-founders and I just started talking to uh, the person who runs it. And they were like, yeah, like, we love your idea. You know, you should you should check it out and come to the Hoosier Hatchery. And it's it's really nice because it's just like a huge office that, you know, not a lot of people are there right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you can collaborate with other companies. And, yeah, there's conference rooms, ton of stuff, fast Wi-Fi. That, that matters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you, there are other companies there. Do you guys when do you guys get together with them, collaborate at all, like maybe develop other ideas or? Yeah. So it's kind of like a huge, um, it's like a large room. So there's no like, you know, cubicles or like it's not sectioned off or anything. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm actually like really good friends with the two other companies that are in there. They're, they're co-founders and we kind of just bounce off ideas. Like I'm actually working with one of them on another project too. So it's it's kind of nice that they didn't separate into like different offices. Instead, it's just a massive open room with a bunch of desks. Just a massive think space. Yeah. So I checked out the app. I downloaded it um, through the Google Play Store. And mm-hmm. It's a beautiful app. You well, know, the, it's the clean. Android one's a little. Is it? Oh, I liked it. Oh, you did. Oh, I did. I... <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't get very far, but I liked what I saw. You know, it just and I saw. I also saw you know screenshots on your site at mm-hmm. GreekRide.com okay. and that kind of thing. But um, it looked very simple and very clean and very well designed. Yeah. So design, what was a bit about that? How did that design process work for you? Yeah, the design was, um, I mean, that's like, I think, majority of the, the whole show behind it. There's there's a ton of thinking that went into that. So the first generation, um, actually, like, I wrote an article about it, and there's like a bunch of screenshots on the first version of Greek Ride. And it is, I look back, and it's horrible. It's so bad. Um, but it, it kind of iterated, um, you know, drawing out new sketches and kind of thinking about what's, like, important to the user instead of, you know, what, you know, what, what, what does everyone else do? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I kind of went down to find like, you know, just a color based off of, you know, what does the user need to do at this point in time? Don't make things too flashy, make them simple, you know, focus on animations and things like that. So it was a very, uh, very long road to like get into where we are today, which is kind of nice, but yeah. <laughs> are there more things you'd like to do with it? With the, with the design, I mean, with the design, um, I'm, I mean, design's always evolving. Uh, right. And I think, though, I'm at a pretty, pretty happy point. You know, it, it took a lot of like courage to say, no, this isn't good enough. I'm not going to I'm not going to put this in the app store. This is this is horrible and yeah. dreadful. But uh, uh, I think I'm at a, at a good point with the design, but it'll always evolve and change, especially, you know, with new features and things like that. Mm-hmm. So how easy was it to get through through the respective app store app stores? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I actually I know Apple interesting must have been story tough. with. Yeah. Interesting story with Apple. They. So we, we submitted an initial version and then came back. they came back to us and said, no, there's like there's some ad in there. And we're like, we didn't have ads in our app. Like, wh- what is this? And so I like called them up a couple times. They called me. It took around like a month. So it was, it was a little bit of a mess with that. And the, the Google one, on the contrast, was uh, we submitted it. 
And then an hour later, I was in the store, and no questions asked. So it's a little, <laughs> a little different. But I mean, you know, that's that's kind of like the the Apple App Store process. Yeah, yeah. Gotta... Well, as an Android user, I think that that worries me sometimes. You know, what kind of app am I getting? Because it's just there. Yeah. Like, did anyone go through this? I know with Apple, it's a different process, and exactly. You know, they're they're a lot more rigid about uh, the requirements and making sure that you meet certain things. And oh, now I'm I'm really concerned. Not about your app. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, the, no, there's nothing the bad in mind. Overall. I no, no, no. promise. <laughs> I, I, I completely believe you. So if a student out there has a great idea and they want to go through the Who's Your Hatchery, how yeah. do they do that? Okay, yeah. So there's two like main ways of doing that. Um, one One's a lot easier than the other. So the first way is you can, uh, the more difficult way is you talk or you need like three professor recommendations, uh, some number like that. You need to go through a ton of interviews with different people who have, you know, some involvement with the hatchery. And then... Uh, you know, they, they sit you down and they either like it or they don't. Um, and the other way that I think is a little bit more easier is the, uh, the idea competition, uh, the clap idea competition. And with that, you submit an idea, you go through, I think it's like a two minute pitch and then you have a five minute like slideshow. And when you, if you win, you get $10,000, just a check written to you with no equity or anything and you get access to the hatchery. Um, so those are kind of the two ways to get there. Which process did you take? Uh, we took the more difficult one of like, uh, interviewing and, yeah, it took a little while too. <laughs> is there is there a reason why you went that down that road? Um, yeah, they're actually the idea competition is I think it's around like now time frame, so you know March time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, and we really needed the office space back in September, so I didn't want to wait. That's fair. <laughs> so you know, we said let's let's go through this process and you know just get there. But yeah. So we talked a little bit about um, you were trying to expand this to Northeastern UConn and maybe a couple other schools. What are your long-term goals for Greek Red? Like beyond question. that. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I, I want to keep evolving it, um, you know, fitting more people's needs with it, adding more features and things like that. I mean, maybe maybe monetize it a little bit or something, but I'm not in it for the money, really. Mm-hmm. This is purely just, you know, it solved an issue that I had, and it solves an issue that a lot of other people have. You know, when I tested it here on campus, Everyone just says they love it, and they made it so it, it makes it so much easier instead of having to call someone who then you know forgets your number or is driving and gets in an accident. Like things like that are just horrible situations yeah. that it fixes. So, um, you know, I don't know. I you know a lot of startups kind of think of you know starting out, and then they think of an end game, and they think you know yeah we'll just sell out, or yeah when we make our first ten million we'll just you know forget about it or something. And the way I see it is you know just live every day as as if there is like no end, you know, or if that is the end, I guess. But that's fantastic. Yeah. So I don't really have long term goal. There's no, you know, sellout or anything like that. It's just try to help as many people as possible. Do you compete with Uber now? Uh, No, no, not really. (laughs) Uh, uh, The reason I say that is because, uh, you know, this like this system already exists. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's people already driving at all these schools for, you know, organizations, whether it be a Greek organization or um, just you know, someone having a party or something. Yeah. Um, and there's no way for that to be organized. So Uber, you know, they do a great job at, you know, if, if you need a ride somewhere now, like you can get that and pay money for it. But for some of these situations, it, you know, there shouldn't be any transactional payments for volunteer drivers, stuff like that. So yeah. I, I wouldn't really think I'd compete with Uber, especially I don't think they would want to get into that game anyway, because it's not a lot of yeah. not a lot of money there. <laughs> yeah, I think also part of my question is, if I'm at the bar Am I thinking Greek right or am I thinking Uber? That's if, actually if I'm just out there on campus or if I'm at, I'm always at the bar. So yeah. if, um, <laughs> which one pops in, in in your mind first and what are you looking for? Yeah, that's that's actually an interesting scenario. Um I think normally what someone in that organization would do is they would think, wow, the their ride organization is horrible. They're not gonna do it, and then mm-hmm. they go to Uber. So I guess in that situation, Uber might become the second option because people realize like, oh, it's a little more organized and I actually can see where my driver is. So yeah, I guess I might be competing with them a little bit in that space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You started web programming at 13. Yeah. I guess I'm curious about the process of going from web programming to just making apps. Was making there apps, yeah. some kind of traditional process? There was, so there was kind of like two milestones, I guess. Um, so I started web programming at like 13 and, you know, very bare bone HTML, like, not pretty kind of stuff. Um, and then I think it was one summer, my junior to senior year or so, uh, my mom uh, saw that there were some borders closing down. 
and uh, I went down there and she's like, you know, go get some books you need to read this summer. So I, I went down there and uh, I found like the most expensive book. It was like 90% off or whatever. And it was five programming languages and one for dummies. So I bought that and decided, you know, I have nothing else better to do. I'm just going to read this entire book and, and learn wow. these five programming languages. So that kind of got me more into the like database side of programming, the, the server side. And then um, I came to college and realized, you know, you can you can do a lot more with apps in a way, you know, because people are have more of like a personal connection with them. They go mm -hmm. to the app store to find it. And uh, honestly, it, it makes a little bit more money than making websites. But uh, yeah, so then I just kind of sat myself down and was like, yeah, you got to learn this and did the same thing with the book. The, yeah, that I sounds like the most <laughs> horrible and yet most best for the long term big picture summer ever. <laughs> it was, so it was bravo to one. your mom, maybe yeah. slide bravo to Borders for closing. I don't know. Yeah. I got a ton of stuff from Borders. They shut down. It was great. <laughs> but I also didn't learn five coding languages. So <laughs> do you have any other ideas on the horizon that you can talk to us about? Um. Yeah, I've actually been working on a couple cool projects. Uh, I guess I could go into kind of detail on one of them. Uh, one idea I had, uh, and I'm kind of currently working on it, is so I, I think there's a problem out there right now of like events. Mm -hmm. You know, no one knows what's going on around them. So I'm working on something that uh, kind of uses a little bit of artificial intelligence to find events for you. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully um, your AI doesn't try to kill Brendan. No, no, it's a, it's a good AI. <laughs> it's a nice one. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Sweet, that's awesome. There's going to be like a marketing push pretty okay. soon, and I hope a lot of people download it. So Okay, sweet. Yeah. Well, let us know, and we will help you do that. So if any of you out there want to learn more about Greek Ride, you can visit them at GreekRide.com or at Greek Ride on Twitter. The app is also available in the Google Play and Apple stores. So thank you, sir. You want to stay around and uh, talk nerdy with us? Definitely. All right, sweet. Next up is Just the Tip with Ross Wilkerson. Hello, Janae, and hello, everyone. I'm in the process of moving, and I've been pondering whether or not I want to cut the cord. That is, would I like to ditch my cable TV subscription and consume media exclusively through the Internet? If you're considering a similar decision, or if you're looking for a creative way to reduce your bills, let's talk through what this might entail. First up, consider what kind of TV you watch. Most of us watch some combination of movies, network series, news, and sports. We need to find streaming options that offer the content you enjoy. You're probably already familiar with Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, iTunes, and Amazon Instant, but I want to draw your attention to three other options. HBO Go is a service most binge watchers will appreciate, and it used to be available only to folks with a traditional cable package. That's no longer the case. There are several internet providers, including Comcast and AT&T, who offer data plans that include HBO Go service without a cable package. Even better, HBO is set to announce a truly standalone option called HBO Now. That should come within the next couple of weeks, and they're claiming it'll be around $15 a month. Sling TV is a good answer for sports, news, and live events. This is $20 a month, and it provides access to the same sort of live television stations you'd get with a traditional cable or satellite package. We're talking about ESPN, CNN, and that sort of thing. This service is extremely new. It's less than three months old, uh, and I think we can probably expect their channel list to expand as it begins to mature. Finally, if you live near a big city, you might be able to get local stations in HD using an antenna. This would be for the killer monthly rate of $0. Folks in Bloomington will receive WTIU, and that's about it. But anybody closer to Indy, Chicago, Louisville, or even Fort Wayne or Terre Haute will get several network affiliate stations. There's a website that will show you what to expect. It's antennaweb.org, spelled just like it sounds. Once you've settled on a service or services to replace cable, we need to make sure you have enough internet. Netflix suggests a download speed of 5 megabits. That'll just barely do it if you're streaming one show at a time, but it's going to get ugly when you want to stream on two devices or download something at the same time. If you can get 10 megabits or better, you'll be much happier with the service. It might also be worth testing your internet speed during various times of day. Whatever speed your contract claims, you probably only get that speed at 4 a.m. on Christmas Eve. The rest of time, it's much slower. Lastly, you need a device to stream on. Most folks will want a Roku, Amazon Fire, or similar device to stream all this content on their television. 
Regular listeners will recall a previous tip about Chromecast. That's a great option for this situation and probably the easiest to set up. Ultimately, I'm still torn. None of these services offer Judge Judy on demand, so I might be stuck with cable for a bit longer. Back to Janae. Many thanks, Ross. Good stuff as always. So let's chat a little tech news before we part ways today. The last three weeks have seen social live streaming become part of the mainstream with the launches of Meerkat and Periscope. These two streaming apps are in like a celebrity death match of sorts for our affections. You've heard of them, guys? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So Meerkat started strong with a, la- with a launch at South By like three weeks ago. And Periscope, which is owned by Twitter, scored a oddly macabre victory when its launch day just a few days ago coincided with a massive gas explosion in Harlem. Did anybody see that? I didn't see the gas explosion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So live streams of this tragedy kind of introduced this ga- this app to the world, um, which is both really beneficial to them and horrible. I think when I'm thinking about it, that's this Joe's world. <laughs> um, is it possible that these services will do to TV what blogs have done to print journalism? Or by TV, I mean newscasts, broadcasts. I don't know. I think it'll just give you more of like a personal view of events that are going on rather than waiting for the news right. to show it. Plus the news only shows like what they want to show and you, all you hear is like a reporter talking all the time. And like I looked at the app and um, for both of the apps actually and it looks like it's just you basically just stream a video with like a caption. Yeah. People can like comment on it or have a conversation about it like as the stream is still going on and that to me is more interactive than like what the what the news would be. So I think it just depends on the person honestly. But. And whether they're capturing good content. Because it seems that if we're all yeah. broadcasters, mm-hmm. why do I need stiff so-and-so from CNN from a perch, right. like from a safe roof telling me what's going on? I think this will still just remain more social. Like if you're, say, for instance, one of the apps had like a picture of a fashion show and like someone's streaming a fashion show and then people are coming on that. Whereas the news is not going to be in there doing like a live cast of the fashion show. They're going to do like the after or before. So you kind of get more in depth with it. And I think a lot of people are just going to stream stuff with their friends anyway. So yeah, that's true. I don't really see it becoming like the news outlet. I think it's going to be more like a video version of Snapchat almost. But that's better. fair. That's fair. What do you think? In the news sense, like I, I did see that live stream of that, that building burning, which was you know, really unfortunate. But yeah. no one was really narrating it. No one had any clue what was actually going on. It was just you just saw a building burning, which was right. Yeah, I don't know. That's, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe if someone was speaking or told me what was going on instead of just like, hey, look at this building, I, maybe it could take over the news. I don't know. It, was there any sound? I don't I, remember. I It was in the middle of class. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should learn instead of <laughs> watching live. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I'm wondering. Maybe if people just, if, if sound is, is if, if there's a sound capability, if there's audio, do people start doing that? Then maybe. I think they're... Should there be. should be audio. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. would make sense like that there's audio. That, yeah. I know. I guess I'm thinking of Twitter and the things yeah. and the impact like Twitter has had on on social movements mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. And so I'm wondering if this can have the same kind of impact where where CNN is waiting to confirm sources. Mm-hmm. You've got people blowing up Twitter with yeah. actual information. Like, if, would, do we have the same thing here? I think no. I don't like. I don't think it'll take over like the no. news outlets. Yeah. But I think that'll definitely like we'll maybe be able to get some things earlier than what. We'll, than like how quickly we would get them if they were actually being vetted by the news system. So, you know, I still think that it's going to have a lot of more personal use than it will be like for news use, but I can see the benefits to both sides of it. Mm-hmm. So, like I can see someone like being at a concert that a friend couldn't be at and like live streaming mm-hmm. the concert for the friend, or, um, but I also can see you being like, like that building that was burning and newscast mm-hmm. or live streaming that before the news actually got a chance to do it. So, yeah. I don't know. So I saw a photo of the Harlem explosion and you had, there was one guy like scaling a building trying to save lives and like 30 people on the, on the ground like this, like just <laughs> holding up phones. And um, I don't know, that concerns me, I guess. It worries me that this is what we're becoming. A lot of the videos. Like, that no news... one's helping anyone anymore. We're, we've got to like capture things so we can share <laughs> yeah. it and prove that we were there. It's like I mean, concerts when the whole, like it, everyone's phone is up and they're yeah. all looking at their screens, not looking at the actual concert. Right, yeah, right. trying to get a video of it. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think a lot of people like record those videos so that the news will get them from them. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I can appreciate them recording the videos, but also you want to make sure the people are safe too. Yeah. So it just it was a really sad picture, and for it took me a while to realize there was a man scaling um, 
emergency stairs to help people. Mm-hmm. I just mm-hmm. saw the people in the street and I was like, oh, that's kind of hilarious. And then, no, it was not hilarious. Yeah. Like, they could be doing something. <laughs> it could definitely turn into, you know, because if you look at Twitter today, um, you know, some newscasters like reference tweets and stuff like that. I think it could be almost like a crutch for um, major news outlets to like, you know, reference Meerkast or mm-hmm. like something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll kind of make Twitter more relevant still. Because I mean, no one really uses Twitter that much anymore. But I think it is, I think it's gonna update Twitter a little bit and make it a little more yeah. modern. Like I'm more prone to use Twitter now because I know that that feature's there. Yeah. Whereas like I probably haven't opened the Twitter app on my phone for like two years maybe. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I don't know. I think they're cool apps. I didn't know anything about them until recently. So, but I guess they haven't been. Well, they haven't been around either. since recently. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious as to why it took so long for someone to create one like this. Well, they've been kind of creating live streaming apps. Like I know uh, Skype tried to have one. They just didn't. They didn't pan out. Maybe it was too soon. Okay. Uh, maybe the software wasn't quite right. They hadn't developed yeah. it well enough. But they also probably use a lot of data. So yeah, yeah, they've got to be data hogs. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think it would take for like a live stream app to get like, widespread adoption? That's tricky. I mean, if you think about it, like there's not a lot of people who have you know that interesting of lives to right, right. <laughs> to live stream their life. For I guess sure. I don't know. That's well, it's going to wind up being like a lot of live streams like from the grocery store, people yeah. doing nonsense. There were a couple of just like cats sleeping. And I was like, all right, well, great. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Oh, interesting. Joe will never live stream because Joe doesn't have a phone from the 2000s. Right. If it doesn't work on a rotary <laughs> phone, I'm not using it. Luddite Joe. <laughs> all right, so Facebook, always Facebook. Hit the news twice last week. First, it was for partnering with major news outlets like the Times, or the New York Times, rather, and BuzzFeed to begin hosting news content and sharing ad revenue with providers. So this should allow Facebook to keep users on its site and make some money in the process. So mm-hmm. if you're a news outlet, like, how do you feel about this? I mean, you're losing res- revenue to Facebook, but you might just miss out on traffic entirely. As a user, I think I'd really like it because when you do click on a link out of Facebook, um, I think the average time is like eight seconds or something for that site to fully load. I think Facebook gave that stat. Um, God, that's way too long. And that's that's really long, and you have to open a new tab and everything, and the user experience is probably, well, it is not the best. So I think Facebook is going after, you know, the user doesn't really want to leave Facebook. They want to just read the content. They don't care about, you know, giving their data to New York Times or having to sign into New York Times to read the article yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So. yeah. Uh, I agree with that, too, because, like, I mean, even for, like, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, like, you usually have to, like, have a subscription to the website in order to read some of the stuff on there. And sometimes all you want is, like, a snippet of information to kind of get the gist of it. Mm -hmm. There's an app called... um, like skim it or skim in or something like that but it takes like all the major news headlines and like just line them up in a day and you just go through and it gives you like maybe two or three sentences of the actual like what happened kind of just like a good paraphrase and then you basically have an update on everything that's happened in like today's newspaper so i think this is kind of be a, what like what facebook will do with this which would be nice because i mean like you were saying like i don't like having to go to an entirely new website for a link that i've clicked on facebook so mm-hmm. Maybe it's just a way for the news um, sites to kind of keep people reading what they're posting. Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't go to the New York Times that much anymore. I mean, I have the app on my phone, but I don't have a subscription to it, so I rarely open it. I feel like I get more news based off what people post to Facebook. And, I mean, even like BuzzFeed, for instance, like BuzzFeed – like they post a lot of stuff on their Facebook page too, but they have a lot more stuff on their website. And I never would have known that had they not originally been posting on Facebook too. So I feel like it's going to be a way for people to obviously stay on Facebook to kind of get a gist of what they want to read. But also if they're curious even further, they can just go look at the actual website. Because I actually downloaded the BuzzFeed app after I started seeing all this stuff on Facebook from BuzzFeed just to see what else they have mm-hmm. on their website. So What's crazy to me about BuzzFeed is I would only go to the site to take absurd quizzes. They Their journalism <laughs> is actually pretty solid when you're talking about whether it's political journalism or sports or whatever. Like, they're really coming along with that kind of thing, and that's nothing I would ever read. Like, I think mm-hmm. I may have to have it pushed to me on Facebook to really pay attention to it because BuzzFeed's not a destination unless I'm trying to find out yeah. um, what sidekick I am or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> or what psychic you are <laughs> yeah so you can find another name for me <laughs> that's right hey you know wash was awesome i i, I that appreciate one. that you <laughs> you might need to get off the show <laughs> there's Next a great topic. show called firefly and you need to know about that show is it an old show oh no not this 
<laughs> I'm not doing this with you. I'm not doing it with you. Audience, the audience knows what Firefly is, okay. and the audience appreciates that. All right. I'll so. look it up, and I'll get back to you. Oh, uh, okay. terrible. <laughs> so also at Facebook's annual F8 conference for app developers, the company announced that Messenger, its standalone messaging app, is about to become a massive platform that features third-party apps to embed media, gifts, video clips, like even package tracking, and it'll have like shopping e-commerce capability. You're not going to have to leave Facebook at all. Period. Not just for news. Basically. I don't know. When the Messenger app first launched, it was kind of annoying because I like just being able to just hit the little message button in the app, on the Facebook app, yeah. and go there. And then you have to open, like, an entirely new app and then, like, go back to the Facebook app just to get back to where you were going. But, I mean, now I kind of like the Messenger app because, I mean, you get your push notifications from there. Um, you don't have to worry about all the other Facebook stuff. So if you just want to talk to someone, like, it's just there for you. Um, I haven't yeah. downloaded it on – I was trying to take a stand – I wouldn't, I, I, yeah, and I haven't <laughs> done it. Like, whenever I get a message, I get mad because it's on my phone just sitting there, yeah. like, not being read. <laughs> and then I'll try to find a browser, my laptop or something, so I can deal with it there. It's so <laughs> inconvenient for me, and I'm just, I'm just putting this burden on myself. It's unnecessary. Yeah, I feel like it's going to be, like, or it's trying to be, like, a new version of, like, BlackBerry Messenger back when that was, like, the ish. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, know, BlackBerry Messenger was the ish when Firefly was on, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I think they're definitely competing with, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Slack. Mm -hmm. It's like a, oh, awesome. It's, yeah, it's like an intercorporate um, kind of like communication platform. And they have a bunch of just, you know, you can add Dropbox, you can add Google Docs. And immediately when Facebook announced that, I was like, oh gosh, Slack is just thinking, they're coming we're after done. Us. Yeah. yeah, we're done. <laughs> we'll we'll take your billion dollar yeah. pick out and go. <laughs> well, Facebook also announced that uh, they're doing like Facebook for business too. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're kind of, I guess maybe it is in line with all of that. I think so. they're really going after Slack. I don't mm -hmm. know. I think that Google should be terrified. Yeah. This is all of their stuff. Yeah. Ad revenue on Facebook is higher than Google can pull with mm. YouTube and that kind of thing. Like I, th I think that they have launched a serious shot across the bow. Because Google didn't really get social right with the Google oh, Plus and everything. Man. And I think that's kind of a core thing to have to make sure someone's, you know, Facebook's, I guess, a little bit more cool than Google Plus. But I don't know. It's tough. I feel like, like Google's Google going, Plus just went nowhere. Yeah, yeah absolutely nowhere. <laughs> yeah. I think what they're like vice president or whatever of Google Plus just kind of left. Yeah, he just like, took off. Yeah. It wasn't even a thing. It's like it was an just... office sinking ship. <laughs> like, yeah. And I feel like Google's kind of not really worried about the social aspects anymore because they're buying up so many different companies now. So they're kind of becoming more like product centric than they are like virtual anymore. Mm -hmm. So, Well, well they're too busy buying up Boston Dynamics. Uh, it's Boston Dynamics? Yeah, the robot. Yeah, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. They're too busy being evil to worry about, <laughs> <laughs> to worry about the rest of this. So um, before we peace out on the news, Brendan... I think you wanted to talk about Elon Musk and the news that Tesla software will enable self-driving cars this summer. I just found it very interesting that we had this whole debacle about him being so against artificial intelligence and how it's evil and all this other stuff. But yeah, he's having a car that's able to like drive you to destinations on its own, like stop for you, turn for you, like all this crazy stuff that's totally centered around artificial intelligence, which I think is cool, but... People in the room think but it's also evil. But he's donating money to make sure that car can't kill you. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. But it only works on the highway, so at least he's being safe about it. Because I don't know how well it would work in like an actual like street or like mm -hmm. city or whatever. But as of right now, it's only on the highway. But I take it you're not going to buy a Tesla? No. I drive too far for the little short distances. Oh, but... you have range anxiety. Mm -hmm. they're, trying to be, they're trying to fix that. They are, but it's not fixed yet. Apparently, this self-driving business will fix the range anxiety, mm -hmm. amongst some other things. Well, I'll wait until someone else tests it out that I know, and then. What if a digital so sociopath could hack your car and go on a killing spree? Maybe Elon thought about that since mm -hmm. he's putting all this money into anti AI stuff, yeah. like iRobot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have thoughts on Elon Musk? Um, I mean, I know he he made that like petition or whatever, and a lot of people signed it for the the anti artificial intelligence or not anti artificial intelligence, but like not letting it you know kill people. Um, I don't know. I kind of like self driving. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I signed it too. But um, I mean, I think it's kind of cool that your car can like. I think it was one demo of it. It can like park itself if you like want to get out, and then it can go find a parking space and then That's come beautiful. back and get you. That's amazing. Like you know, if you go to Starbucks and come back out, it'll just be there waiting. Um, 
it's kind of useful, kind of scary, but I, I don't need know. to put that software on my Jeep. <laughs> that would be nice, yeah. Because <laughs> that's like the worst thing. You're trying to find a parking space for like 15 minutes and your car can just do that. What I want what I want the car to be able to do is roll up behind people who are going to their spaces and just kind of quietly stalk them. <laughs> <laughs> while you're inside. <laughs> while I'm in the store. Just freaking people out. Oh, you're just getting your Starbucks. <laughs> And then when that person keeps walking and keeps walking, the yeah. car can give up and, like, try again. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect use of artificial intelligence. <laughs> you got to think of these things. This stuff is important. <laughs> the target, like, parking lot creep. <laughs> Before we wrap things up, I think we might want to hit a sad trombone on IT. <laughs> With the news that Apple would like to rewrite history and uh, make Steve Jobs a saint by celebrating this new unauthorized Steve Jobs biography. Did you guys hear about that? Yep. Yep. I don't really hear much about it, but I think it's interesting. I mean, you know how we had that movie come out and everything with Ash and Kutcher? I mean, wasn't there, like, two movies? That's a sad trombone in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, that was not the best movie. <laughs> yeah, but. but I mean, like, I feel like people deserve to see, like, both sides of him. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not going to get a real good, like, appreciation for his life and, like, what he's done if you just think that he's, like, some saint either. I mean... I don't know. I feel like the the one that was already out was all good to go, but the uh, the authorized bio, yeah, by Walter Isaacson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I thought the one by by uh, Isaacson was kind of it, it kind of like stopped when it reached, um, I guess, like the iCloud iPad era, and it just kind of just shut down from there, and it yeah. like less and less details started to appear because it you know for trade secrets and stuff. But um, I've been reading this one, and I'm, I think I'm like halfway through, and it, it's a lot more in depth than like Tim Cook's relationship and Johnny Ive's relationship. So it's more of like his relationships with the people that are closer to him, instead of uh, Isaacson's kind of just overall view of you know what Steve Jobs is with a, with everyone. Right. So, so right. this one's more about. So they they want to promote the versions that they're in exactly. yeah, and where they yeah, look exactly. great. That's pretty so think, shady. What was it? Apple like just today like featured some like I think it was like a podcast or something of. The two people who wrote the book, um, like interviewed with some some blogger or something, and they like put it on the front page of iTunes, and I was like, oh, of course Apple, he just of course they did. <laughs> just write at history, it's fine. Like it, I don't understand why they need to bash the Isaacson version. I mean, I mm. no book can truly capture anyone, any sort of personality, because there are too many shades to a person. But it offered up Jobs as I think the tyrant. He was in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, whether that explored some of his softer side and his his better relationships, it still presented an authorized view, a view he authorized yeah. um, to be presented to the world. I don't really understand what the problem, why they would have a problem with that. There well, can be you uh, both can be good, both can be useful. Well, I feel like now that Steve Jobs is gone, like people still mainly focus on him, and like his mm-hmm. name is like synonymous with Apple. And since there's new like leadership in Apple, I think they want recognition as well. So maybe this book is going to provide like some light on how they actually were like instrumental in the success of Apple and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So I can understand why the executives there would want the book to come out or why they want their story told as well. Because I mean, everyone's still focused on Steve Jobs, even though he's been gone for X amount of years now. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I think that that was one problem that they had when when Steve passed away was uh, mm-hmm. you know what's Apple going to do? Because Steve was the entire company. But mm-hmm. I think what they're trying to kind of change the narrative to like, no, Steve was the head of the company, but there were a lot of people working with him right. um, that are still there and they're still he working. He didn't do it by himself. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, even the Isaacson pr- book proves that he didn't do it by himself. He didn't start yeah. anything by himself. Like mm-hmm. he needed Wozniak to build these boards and do these <laughs> things, and then he went out and sold them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's it's he clearly needs assistance. He needs partners throughout the way. There's, I don't, yeah. know. I don't know. I can see why they want it. To change the narrative a little bit. Right. Well, I'll have to read it. Pretty important. I'll read it and then throw a side eye at Tim Cook anyway. But... <laughs> <laughs> For bashing the Isaacson version. So <laughs> with that, my friends, I bring episode 17 of Talk Nerdy to me to a close. If you have any questions, feedback, or want to say hi, you can reach out to us online at talknerdy.iu.edu, on Twitter at talknerdy.iu, and via email at nerdy at iu.edu. And if you want to learn more about starting a business via IU's Hoosier Hatchery, visit kelly.iu.edu slash jce. I. On behalf of Brendan, Ross, and Joe, this is Janae Cummings. Thank you for listening. We'll see you again in May.
This has been an official production of the IT Communications Office, copyright 2015, the trustees of Indiana University.